Imagine it's a gorgeous sunny day, just like last Easter Sunday, and you're out on a walk. And I know it's been that way today, but let's remember Easter because it's particularly magical on Easter Sunday after a long, rainy winter. If you'd like, close your eyes for a minute and just remember how glorious it was. I went for a long walk after Mass, and the colors took my breath away. The blue sky, the puffy white clouds, the dozens of shades of spring green, blossoms and flowers bursting, birds singing, so many people out walking their dogs, the scent of Daphne, Pyrrhus, and fragrant sweet box. It was simply stunning. I used to miss this kind of beauty, always so busy and up in my head, so full of responsibilities and plans. Don't get me wrong, I love beauty and the natural world, always did, but I tended to notice it best when I was away on vacation and away from the daily demands which seemed to constantly preoccupy me. Then years ago, an initially terrifying journey with cancer rendered me present to the world around me with a whole new quality of appreciation and wonder. What broke me also slowed me down, broke me open, and apprenticed me more deeply to wonder, appreciation, and delight in the simple beauties that I had been taking for granted. It was then, 14 years ago, that I began without even trying to somehow notice the click of a hummingbird from 50 feet away. Now, my regularly noticing of the beauty all around me is my favorite medicine when the world feels too much. Simple neighborhood walks, something I used to do in a preoccupied fashion, but now in perpetual wonder, they sometimes save me. Sometimes the hard things of life, times that for me are like fight or flight syndrome and terror, sometimes they open us up to new things. For Jesuit Tehard de Chardin, it was while being a stretcher bearer during the First World War on the bloody fields of France that he began to notice more deeply the wonders of the night sky and the beauty of birdsong. In those things, he found hope and even believed in the possibility of a future. So too, in the time of Jesus, terror reigned. The Roman occupation was crushing. According to first century Romano-Jewish historian Flavius Joseph, when Jesus was three or four years old, living in the village of Nazareth, some 2,000 people whose suppressed rage against Roman brutality had spilled into rebellion, 2,000 were crucified. Their village of Sephoris was then burned. Nearby villages were also burned, and many inhabitants were carried off as slaves. And this happened about five kilometers from Nazareth. We know this, we, can you imagine? We can only begin to imagine what it was like for Jesus and the Jewish people to grow up in this shadow, this reign of terror. We can be sure that this brutal Roman intervention was remembered for a long, long time. And Jesus must have been terrified as a child and through much of his growing up years. We know that this kind of occupation, this kind of terror, has been used to capture lands and control people and control wealth since time immemorial. All we have to do is look at the news coming out of Ukraine and see the horrifying, heartbreaking, and rage-inducing evidence of brutality, torture, and mass killings. And unless we think this is only the behavior of other people, like Russians, all we need to do is remember the thousands of lynchings in the Deep South, right here in our own country. Lynchings often attended by white, family with the, white families with their children and picnic baskets in hand, prepared to watch the spectacle. We are a sinful people all, and in every nation, 
and in every place at one time or another in our broken histories, terror is used to control, oppress, suppress, and to deny other people the abundant fruits and blessings of creation which were meant for everyone. So imagine now whatever kind of hard things you've known or lived. Cancer, death of someone beloved, the loss of a child, being bullied in school, or being disappointed in yourself, or maybe even deeply ashamed for living in a way that's incongruent with what you know to be a good life. Perhaps you've cheated on your partner or your taxes, or you've been unkind to others, or you've gossiped cruelly, or in some other way you've broken a moral code that matters and you're eaten up inside. Along with that, we all live in dangerous times in one way or another, worrying about the threat of global warming, the rising cost of living, the shame and cruelty of systemic racism, and always anxiously, who will be elected and in power in our country next. But let's go back for a minute now, because it's a gorgeous day, and you're out walking with friends. Birds are singing, and there's a scent of flowers. And yes, you carry a lot of suffering within you. But the beauty around and the presence of your friends gives reprieve, and your heart is light. You've been talking about the man Jesus because there's a buzz all over town. There's something about him that's strong and true, clear and bright, something tenderly radiant with compassion that you crave. Like the compassion flowing from the eyes of Jesus on the cover of our bulletin this weekend. These compassionate eyes rendered by my friend Chamayo, a man behind bars at Monroe Correctional Complex. He made this beautiful painting for this very weekend, Divine Mercy Sunday. And imagine, as you're walking with your friends, you actually run into this man, Jesus. And he looks at you with those eyes, and he sees you, really sees you fully, the longings of your heart, the mistakes you've made, your beauty, your shame, and he looks at you with tenderness and joy at who he sees. Then, of all things, he invites you to his house, which is exactly what happened to his first companions as revealed in John chapter one. And they hang out with Jesus all day, talking and getting to know each other. Jesus lived at home, and so Mary probably served tea and something good to eat. Maybe Joseph came in sweaty and tired, but warm and friendly after a day of hard labor. And on that day, you fall in love with Jesus, just like the disciples did. He invites you to follow him, and he has so captured your heart and soul that you want nothing more than to be one of his companions. So you toss out every plan you've had, and you go with him. And oh boy, it's exhilarating. It's challenging, but it's also fulfilling, and pride swells within you because, let's face it, you're with him. You're one of the good guys, the ultimate crowd, really, and you're on the winning team, and you know it, and you can't help but feel kind of special. When I read or listen to scripture carefully, I can't help but notice there's sometimes subtle and sometimes not so subtle signs of a certain pride smugness and privilege amongst those guys who were hanging out with Jesus. Yeah, they were pretty good guys, and they loved Jesus, and they did some good work, but they were also a bit removed from the grit. They were just a little bit better than the ones they ministered to, a little bit above it all. And don't we just love being ministered to by those who are a little bit better than us, a little bit above it all? I don't think so. So these power guy companions of Jesus, with a love so deep that they would sh were sure they would follow him anywhere, how on earth did they end up huddled in fear in the upper room, in shame and terror, locked behind the door where we meet them today? How on earth did they fail so miserably and end up there? 
How do we end up there? Because I know I've been there several times. How about you? Is it necessary? Why? I was a little girl when I first felt the swell of love for Jesus and a desire to follow him. By middle school, I was quietly trying to find ways, and by college, studying theology and planning a life of lay ministry. But as my friends behind bars would say, it's been a minute since those early days. And over the last 40 years, I've come to believe with a deep conviction that the utter failure of the disciples was absolutely necessary. In in fact, it was the best thing that could have happened. We cannot, and I mean we are utterly incapable of, extending real, healing, restorative mercy to others before we come to learn that we are desperately in need of it ourselves. And that requires a necessary humility to open up to it completely, like my friends behind bars do. Those we meet in our JRJI Northwest programming who arrive in prison broken. It's hard to be humbled until we fall in some way, until we are broken and we can't make it on our own. Maybe when our kin behind bars first arrive, ashamed and terrified, many, so so they tell me, continued to live violently or in anger or in other distorted ways for a time. But eventually, those who show up in our programs had come to their senses like the prodigal son and begin to beg for and receive the love of God. And most of them have done this in their own hearts long before we show up. Something in them is longing for and working toward a transformed life. And boy, oh boy, have you ever met someone who's illumined by the mercy and love of God? Those wounded healers that we're drawn to and in whom we can see hope and find a way? They model for us a path of love and freedom, a path they can only model because they've been brought low and they've come back to life again. This past Wednesday, the daily reading from the Acts of the Apostles refers to the beautiful gate, the entrance to the temple, the Holy of Holies, metaphorically, the place we all long to welcome, all long to enter and be welcomed. Outside is a beggar who cannot make his way without help. And he too is each and every one of us, beggars before God. And then along comes Peter, the minister of God's love and mercy, who is uniquely suited to his new vocation, precisely because he is a man who fell and was forgiven and healed, and then missioned from a place of receiving mercy. When the beggar asks Peter for alms, he says, I have nothing to give you, no silver or gold. All I have is the love and mercy of God. And Peter, too, is us. And all of us are called to recognize the imperfect, messed up beggars we all are before God and to be opened by the hard and demanding grace of humility so that we can embrace mercy ourselves and then become radiant with it for others. So much so that perhaps it can even spill from our eyes like it does from the Jesus on the cover of our bulletin. That's what this Divine Mercy Sunday is all about. The mission of JRJI Northwest is to walk with our kin behind bars and on that journey to create a beloved community both inside and outside the walls, one body, one community. And we are only fit to walk this journey if we, like Peter, know that largely we have nothing to give, that there's nothing superior about us, that we're all vulnerable and in need. Our walk, our part in bearing witness to the love and mercy of God is to stand in trust and conviction in the truth of what I like to call the middle place, a paradoxical place where we acknowledge both the hard, horrible, and painful things that have happened or been done to us, as well as the harms and wrongs that we have done. That paradoxical place is where we find deep kinship with others who stand in the same place. And there, 
transformational healing happens. There, we are restored to one body, God's plan all along. Before I finish, I want to mention that JRJI Advisory Board member, dear Dr. Estelle Williamson, is here with me tonight. And after Mass, we'll be in the vestibule wearing our JRJI Northwest lanyards. And if you'd like to talk or have any questions about our work, we'd be delighted to chat with you. You also have a beautiful brochure that another wonderful advisory board member, Mary Cunningham, put together for us. And I hope it will give you a bit of a picture and a sense of who we are and what we're about. We are a work of Jesuits West Province, missioned to become an independent 501c3 in the next couple of years. A daunting task when I think about the rapidly expanding administration and fundraising. And yet over the last few years, we've created robust programming that is bringing healing, hope, and transformation. This work was called into being by God, and so we trust that God will now help us in the practical details of solidifying the resources and foundational supports that make our work possible. We are so grateful for our benefactors who make it possible. In closing, I'd like to share a theme that was given to me this year over Christmas, quite unbidden, because I'm not typically one of those people who do those end of the year word puzzles or look for a theme for the new year. But Bob, where is he somewhere? Bob and I learned a new song for Christmas that's quite literally called New Song, thanks to Father Mike Baird, who had texted the song to me because he thought I would like it. And there's a line in the chorus that went straight to my heart with a new kind of visceral clarity, and it made me weep. Joy to the world, his plan all along. Joy to the world, his plan all along. And then, like a movie screen, in my mind, I can see the harrowing suffering all over our world. Our kin behind bars, our kin at the border, our children shivering and alone in detention centers, our siblings all over the world, hungry, brutalized, and oppressed in every way. And that beautiful line keeps singing in my heart, joy to the world, his plan all along. So as I embrace the paradoxes of our world, the breathtaking beauty of Easter Sunday, my new and recent journey with terror since my husband's recent diagnosis and a complex cancer, the suffering all over the world, I feel more and more compelled to find my way of becoming God's divine mercy for others. Joy to the world, his plan all along. I want to find my place in collaborating with that beautiful vision of God, and I bet you do too. God bless each and every one of us. May we faithfully walk our unique path of spreading liberally God's restorative mercy, until one day we all realize our common promised destiny of joy.